going to ask uh, our, our, our Director of Operations, Nadine Ferris Francis, to introduce our uh, keynote speaker uh, coming up shortly. Thank you very much. Great, so I get the, uh, the honor and um, the pleasure of introducing Sasanki Misamang to you this morning. Um, the reason for that is because um, Sasanki and I met um, quite a long time ago. We were 24 years old, uh, living in South Africa, and we met together when we were in a workshop trying to learn how to facilitate online dialogue amongst civil society working on HIV and AIDS. And that was at a time where online and, and web really was quite new to us in terms of how do we actually harness its potential. So we've stayed connected ever since. Um, one thing about Sasanki back then and has continued with her is that she's very outspoken, um, beautifully articulate in her outspokenness, and she really challenges all of us to continue to do better and to make sure that we don't get, I don't know, jaded and tired in the rhetoric of HIV and in, in global health. So I think you're going to really uh, enjoy her this morning. Um, she's a writer and an activist. Um, her work looks at the intersections between health, democracy, and human rights. Um, she most recently was lead editor and writer of a publication called AIDS Today, Tell No Lies and Claim No Easy Victories. And that's a publication that was put out by the HIV AIDS Alliance. She is currently the policy director with Sunky Justice, Sanki Gender Justice in South Africa. She's an Aspen Institute New Voices Fellow, and in 2012, she was awarded a fellowship at Yale University. Prior to this, she was the Executive Director of uh, Open Society Initiative of Southern Africa for five years. And even before that, again, she's worked in the United Nations at all different levels, regional, national, and global. Um, on top of, all, of it all, if she hasn't got enough to do, she also produces um, a weekly column in uh, the Daily Maverick in South Africa, in Joburg. Um, and you can follow her. She's quite active as well. You can follow her on Twitter, on at Sasanki Misamang. So please welcome her. It's her first visit to Ireland. It's an incredibly short visit because she's also a mother of two small children. She has a six-year-old and a three-year-old who need her back home. So welcome her to Ireland and enjoy her talk titled Health, Violence and Poverty, Lessons from the Oscar Pistorius Trial. So, great expectations. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation. It's fantastic to be in Ireland. Um, I, I wish I was going to be here for longer, but also very special that this is the 10th year um, anniversary of the, of the forum, so um, really an honor uh, to be invited. I am always still shocked that anyone wants to hear what I have to say, um, so <laughs> just pleased that that's happening. Nadine asked me to talk about um, partnerships and the role of partnerships in global health. And so the title of my talk, it went through several incarnations. And first I was going to call it Sustainable Partnerships for Equity and Health in a New Global Framework Towards a Model of Addressing Blah, Blah, Blah. But I thought you might have already heard that talk before. Then I thought I would just call it Partnerships are Good. Cooperation is good. But I didn't think that anyone would listen to me. And so I decided to pique your interest by having some salacious, juicy mention to something that has really taken over um, South African uh, society in the last year. We've been full of news. There's a 24-hour news channel um, just on Oscar Pistorius, um, lots and lots of commentary about it. It's been sort of a, I don't know, there was a statistic, a billion tweets um, in the first hour of the trial. Um, so somehow, this has captured the imagination of people. and so. I thought I would, would hook onto that. I've spent most of my two decades, Nadine is tell, giving away our ages. I've spent most of my two decade um, career working on development. First I worked for the UN, um, and then I worked for the Open Society Foundations. Um, and in the last two years, um, I've started to take a little bit of a different tack, and I decided that um, while the work uh, that my colleagues and I have been doing in various institutions are important, um, it was equally important to begin to have a bit more of a public voice uh, and to combine um, uh, the kind of bureaucratic work with a, a more of a, an activist approach um, to getting things done. Um, because while I think that there's a really important role for technical approaches and, and people in this room are technical specialists and so that is crucially important, 
um, to having good biomedical uh, programs, to having good health systems. I also think that um, increasingly there's a really big need for, for activism and for tackling the politics. Um, and I think it's really important that we remind those who hold the purse strings, uh, whether they be global, whether they be national actors, regional actors, um, that there will be consequences both at, at the ballot box and in communities um, when health is not delivered. So increasingly that's the direction uh, that I'm going. So that means that today I spend a lot of my time writing and talking about uh, money, power, and sex. Yeah? Because living in South Africa, you have to deal with the social determinants of health. And in our society, very much, these are them, money, power, and sex. The, the things that are underneath the spread of any given virus or um, any cause of ill health, um, the things that propel an ep epidemic usually boil down to this. And this is what Lori Garrett, um, who many of you will have heard of, this is what she calls social amplifiers. And it seems to me that if we're not talking about and doing something about social amplifiers, which doesn't always fall into the ambit of the work that you think you're supposed to be doing as health specialists, but it's crucial to take that stuff um, into account. So um, I wear lots of hats, or shall I say I wear lots of turbans. Um, and one of those hats is that I direct an advocacy campaign uh, which is trying to push the South African government uh, to developing a comprehensive, fully costed, fully budgeted for strategic plan on gender-based violence. We've never had one, and you will know um, about what a significant uh, challenge gender-based violence is to, to, to South Africa. Um, the organization that drives this, the organization um, that I spend a lot of my time at, although not all of it, um, is called Sonke Gender Justice. So, uh, Sonke in, uh, in Zulu means we are together, and my name Sisonke means we are together, and so it's purely coincidental. I am not named after the organization, nor is the organization named after me. Um, and I'm pleased to note that we received generous funding from Irish Aid. They've been one of our long-standing partners, and a partner um, that's been important to us because of the levels of trust. Um, so, so thank you, Liz, and, and those of you who are from um, Irish Aid. It's good to know that some of our colleagues from, from Africa are here. I want to say a little bit about Sonke, and then I'm going to get into the meat uh, of my presentation. So Sonke started seven years ago, um, so we're still relatively young, working primarily with men and boys. Um, because if you're going to work on gender justice and you only work with women, then you're missing a key part of the equation. Um, and there were very few organizations, uh, if any at the time in South Africa, that worked uh, almost exclusively with men and boys. Um, and the idea was to work on gender-based violence and HIV infection. It was at a time when HIV infections were incredibly high, as they still are today. And it seemed to us that we needed to tackle masculinities. Um, Today we work with um, women and girls and men and boys, so really the Sonke name, bringing us all together. Um, but we, we, we really still do continue a strong and heavy focus on, on the issue of masculinities. Um, we work at the intersection of human rights, HIV, and gender justice. And so my remarks today are really gonna look at, um, at partnerships through this lens. Um, so I wanna focus on three things today. I wanna focus on the role of civil society, and pushing for better public um, health outcomes, particularly looking at the twin epidemics of HIV and gender-based violence. But you can, in many ways, choose your own epidemic, right? You can choose the, the health issue that you want. Those are the, the two that I, we happen to focus on. Um, and then I'm gonna look at how civil society has fared in, in pushing for better and more sustainable uh, funding for health at a global level. Um, so moving out from a country example to a, a, a sort of bigger global take. And, and I'm gonna argue that civil society hasn't done such a great job. And I think one of the things that happens is that you belong to a sector so you feel as though you can't criticize it. <laughs> and I think it's important that we're able to critique um, ourselves. So I think civil society hasn't done such a great job on the funding one, I wanna talk about that a little bit. And then lastly, I wanna talk about what you can do, people in this room can do. Um, so I wanna talk about the place and role of solidarity rather than pity. Uh, in addressing um, some of these um, uh, broader health challenges that we face. And Ebola, I think, is a great example. Um, can we get the first slide? Oh, I see, great. Perfect. So as you all know, this is Riva Steenkamp. 
this is the model who was um, killed by Oscar Pistorius on Valentine's Day 2013. Yeah, you've probably seen her image many, many times, um, even if you weren't uh, necessarily interested in the case in many ways because of the global media attention, because of this fallen um, hero who was not just a hero in South Africa, Oscar Pistorius was sort of symbol of overcoming um, many, many impediments uh, for many people around the world. And so this kind of, the killing of Riva became um, much more of a symbol of his downfall than it was a symbol of a woman whose life was taken. So everyone has seen uh, the picture of Riva Steenkamp. And the trial of Oscar Pistorius and the trial of, uh, the, and, and the, the, the legal case that preceded in many ways was far more about people's interest in Oscar and his life than it was about people's interest in Riva and her death. And in a country where so many women are killed on a daily basis by an intimate partner, um, we missed, I think, a very important opportunity to really spotlight the issue of, of femicide. And we really missed an opportunity to talk about gender-based violence um, because regardless of what the outcome of the case was, which was that it was culpable homicide rather than that it was murder, um, one of our local um, writers, Margie Orford, wrote in the Guardian newspaper, it was an excellent piece, and she said that one, uh, one walks away from this trial with a real feeling of dis-ease, that so much was left unsaid, both by the country, but in the way in which the court case played itself out. And many of the things that were left unsaid about both the um, attention to the trial um, and the attention to Oscar, uh, but also I think the intense media reason why people were interested was that it was about celebrity. That was the interest, rather than the ordinary daily killings of um, largely black South African women, but women of all, all races uh, and all socioeconomic groups. So Riva, um, the killing of Riva was, uh, pro provided us a lens and an opportunity to look at what we could do to talk about gender-based violence. And I think as South African society, we missed the opportunity. This is Noma Itali Mthauli. This is the mother of a woman called Sandiswa Mthauli, who was killed, she was 29 years old. And she was killed um, on December 9th, um, 2013. Um, Sandiswa is um, a woman who lived in a community in which Sankey's Gender Justice does lots and lots of work. Um, and if you look at this picture, you'll see that um, Noma India is sitting, no, Noma Italy is sitting in front of the grave of her daughter. Yeah, so right behind that um, pile of, of, of um, upturned earth is her is, is Sandis was grave. And in the distance, you see two blurred out figures. Those are Sandis was two kids who she left uh, behind when she was, when she was murdered. Sandis was murdered um, in a taxi. She had spent um, months going to the police back and forth, trying to get protection order um, because her husband had been harassing her and it had become an increasingly violent relationship and so her and her mother had gone to the police station several times and several times the police had said you people you women come and you complain and then you change your mind right you're going to get back together with him and then we're going to be the ones stuck in the middle so we're not going to give you this thing you're not serious and she come back several times and so finally she had the protection order in her handbag and it was um, the last day of the 16 the campaign of 16 days um, to end violence against women and so she had it in her handbag and she got into a taxi, a, a public transport. They live in the Eastern Cape in um, a rural community outside of the village of Iduchwa. And so Sandy Sol was sitting, uh, waiting for the, the, the taxi to be filled up with, uh, with enough people for it to then drive uh, towards her village. And her husband um, approached uh, with a knife and in front of everyone in the taxi, he stabbed her to death. This um, is a picture of Melikaya Solonzi. 
this is the taxi driver. This is the taxi that Sandiso was killed in. And this is the, the, the driver of the taxi. Um, uh, we, have a, we have a communications team, and because we were so closely involved in the case, we, um, we got to know everybody involved in the case. And we have uh, one of our um, staff member, a young woman called Demelza, and she's a CNN uh, you know, award-winning photojournalist. She won the CNN Africa Journalist of the Year Award. So we're very proud to have her on staff, and she's an amazing personality. And so she was talking to the people in the community, and she said, we'd love to capture your photos. And so she asked, where do you want these pictures to be taken? And so they chose the spot. So, so Sandiso's mom chose the spot that you saw a second ago. Um, and Nelly Kaya chose, chose this spot in many ways because this was um, a, obviously a very traumatic uh, event that has really dominated the life of this community, uh, in part because of the activism um, that has followed. And then I want to show you a last picture. And this picture um, is a young woman called Ndombi Futi Nkoli. And she um, was sitting in that taxi that day. She's a um, 17 year old. She's writing her matric, which is her, her school leavers exam. She's uh, about to finish school. In fact, in now, in the next few weeks, um, she's supposed to be writing. It's been very difficult for her to focus on her studies um, since this happened. Um, and in part, um, her story is one about the fact that um, often when we cite statistics about gender-based violence, um, it's as though it happens only to one person. And I think we all uh, recognize that violence happens to a community. In the South African context, it's, re it's repeated traumas and violence, but it's also um, that we don't recognize that now a child's right to health, uh, to education is being infringed, not just a woman uh, who was killed, her, life, her right to dignity and her right to life. So these stories um, are, are important stories to us, and I want to tell you a little bit about the context, right? So Sandiswa had her, her protection order too late in her handbag and was killed with it in, in her bag. She was killed um, after uh, 6 o'clock in the evening, and the state forensics uh, team, despite the fact that most murders, most violent deaths happen in the evening, is not open after 6. And so nobody was there to come and take photos of the scene uh, when it happened, which, as we know, is a crucial thing to do if you're going to have a fair trial and a proper case that goes forward. So that, so that didn't happen. Um, when the case started, um, there were a number of postponements because the state was totally unprepared uh, to, to, uh, for anything. So the prosecutor um, is legally required to oppose bail in a, an incident such as this. It's just the way that it works. That's the rules. In this case, Sandis was um, mother's, the, the prosecutor's state, state prosecutor didn't oppose bail, and so her killer was out on the streets. Um, there were many, many witnesses. Um, I, I don't think I need to paint how um, terrible that situation is for someone to to be walking the streets, and especially for Sandy's was mom. So when Sonke Gender Justice um, got involved, we have a team of young lawyers that go every year to train. So in the spirit of partnerships, they go to U UCLA. Every year they do a one-year master's and they come back um, and they um, spend a year with Sonke Gender Justice um, doing whatever it is that we ask them to do. So Martina Hunter is one of our young lawyers, an amazing young woman who sort of took this case by the throat and decided that she was not going to let, let go of this until justice was served. And so um, Martina and our community action teams basically got on the scene, mobilized with all the taxi drivers. Um, um, Melikaya was extremely distraught by what had happened, but also used his role and place in the community as a taxi driver. People who have visited South Africa, or any place in Southern Africa will know how crucial public transport is. And these taxi drivers are both ex incredibly frustrating in the way that they drive <laughs> and disobey the laws, but are also community leaders in many ways. And we, we often talk about the negative uh, role that they play. We've talked about that in terms of HIV, but they also play an incredibly important role. And so Melikaya organized taxi drivers to say enough violence as men we've got to do something about this. And so there was a lot of activism that, that, um, that, that then subsequently took place around mobilizing using the court dates. 
So when a court postponement would happen, that would be the, the, where people watching, the eyes and the ears of the community were open to make sure that um, the usual postponements and delays and the slow pace of things that happens didn't continue to happen. Um, and so in the end, we got um, justice for Sanju Swoy, whatever that's worth. Her, she's no longer with us. She, her kids have no mother. Um, but we got a, uh, an incredible nine-month case. The Riva and Oscar, um, the, the, the trial of Oscar Pistorius took 18 months. We got a, a case done in nine months, which is um, in many ways a record. Um, a recent report in South Africa done in Kailicha looked at the average case of, um, uh, of a, 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 a rape uh, of a woman in South Africa takes seven years. So the fact that we were able to get this um, case done, so it was expected that it would be quick with Riva because the media attention was on it and so everyone was watching and you had the best lawyers, uh, you know, they, the state put on its best prosecutor, et cetera, et cetera. In a rural community, in a place like Ijuchwa, for us to get a conviction in nine months is incredible, right? So what we learned from that story was that it's possible for women in South Africa to get justice. Um, but we also know that it's impossible that there be human rights lawyers flown in from Joburg, that there be community action teams mobilized in every single community outside of South Africa, right? That's not a sustainable model. And so for us, the question is how do we push forward um, a plan for gender-based violence where the state takes um, responsibility for, for this? Um, most ordinary, most for most ordinary, non-famous, non-first world women who are the victims of gender-based violence, the journey in South Africa is a very long and arduous one. So let me put it in a little bit of context. In South Africa, um, every eight hours, a woman is killed by her intimate partner. So that means in the time that we will be having this conference, how many women will be killed? Nine. Yeah, if we just look at the working days, there'll be nine women killed in South Africa. So it's not like they will, they might be, they will be, yeah? So every, every eight hours a woman is killed uh, in South Africa by her intimate um, partner. And to put it into global perspective, that's six times the global femicide rate. So South Africa has a very, very serious problem um, with, with gender-based violence. Um, so what are we doing about it? What we are doing about it is building a campaign to get the nation talking about gender-based violence proactively. So what happens in South Africa, which I'm sure happens in Ireland and happens all over the world, is that when something particularly horrible happens, then people talk about gender-based violence, right? So then it becomes a talking point. And then what happens is that the outrage machine requires that the next time something even worse happens. Otherwise, there isn't a response anymore, right? So. So, so we have had uh, some very, very horrible things happen, but then the media forgets about it and the public forgets about it, and then the next time we're upset is because something really, really bad happens, as though rape in itself is not um, horrendous. So our, the campaign's main objective is to say to the South African government that you put in place a plan for HIV and AIDS um, which is world class. Everyone around the world has recognized that South Africa's national strategic plan on HIV and AIDS is outstanding and that we have allocated resources. We're a middle income country. We've allocated resources um, to address HIV AIDS um, and that's fantastic. But that on gender based violence, which is an epidemic of stunning proportions, um, the South African government is unable to demonstrate to us one single rand that it puts into dealing with the epidemic. Not because it isn't spending money on it in some ways at the moment, but there's no coherence, to use the, the phrase that um, Liz was talking about earlier, right? There's no coherence. It's not clear exactly how much money is being spent and who's responsible. Essentially, there is no plan for addressing one of the largest problems that we have as a society. Not as a women's issue, not as an is issue of um, gay and lesbian people who um, in South Africa has a humongous problem with the, the, the murders of, les of black lesbians in the townships, uh, again, because it comes from the same place, right? So not as an issue of those people, but as a national uh, question. So the main objective is to say to the government, we need a plan. 
We need a fully funded plan. We're talking about a lot of money. So what we're asking for is in the region of 10 billion rands, which is the equivalent of about a billion um, US dollars. And when we talk about that figure, people often say that's totally unrealistic. On, on what basis are you suggesting that we put that amount of money? The state doesn't have that kind of money. So again, a few statistics to put things in perspective. Um, last year, the South Africa's Auditor General uh, reported, so this is South African government statistics, it's not NGO cooked up, made up numbers. The South African Auditor General suggested, uh, told us that um, South Africa wasted through um, fruitless and wasteful, I love these phrases, fruitless and wasteful expenditure was 32 billion rands, right? So if we're talking about 10 billion rands for a plan to end gender-based violence, then we're talking about one third of the money that the government itself wasted, right? On projects that didn't get done, on consultants who did this and who didn't do this, et cetera, et cetera. So we're talking about a relatively small amount of money. One of the partnerships that we entered into as Sankey Gender Justice as part of this campaign was with KPMG, right? Everyone trusts accountants, it's a global firm, one of the big four, so we believe what they say. So what they say is that um, they've, done a, uh, they've done a study and looked at all the data that was available in South Africa, and the cost of um, gender-based violence to the South African economy is between 28 and 42 billion rands a year. So just about 1% of GDP, GDP is being eaten away by gender-based violence. So these are um, guys in gray suits who are very serious and not emotional and not hot-blooded, and they are telling us that this is the cost of gender-based violence. One of the things we've learned about partnerships in this campaign is that you have to be strategic and smart about them, and that you don't always have to enter into formal partnerships um, with a signed MOU, and that in some ways, if you try to do that, you force people back into their shells when they were just starting to come out. I did an interview a few weeks ago with CNBC Africa, which is a business channel, um, and the reason why they interviewed me, which had never happened before, was because KPMG did a report on the cost of gender-based violence. So it allowed a few women within CNBC Africa who are very interested in gender-based violence and who are dealing with lots of very challenging issues within the organization itself, because we seldom think about that. It allowed them an excuse to cover the story and they're doing a mini documentary on the costs of gender-based violence to the South African economy, right? So it allowed us an entry point but when we discussed, when we had discussions with the, the, the team at KPMG who were doing the, the report, they said to us, don't push us around a formal partnership because it's never going to happen. Once it gets to the uh, formal highest levels, it will be seen as, you know, uh, government is our biggest um, client, biggest source of uh, funding for this um, human, for this human practice uh, that they've just set up. And it's not good for us to be seen to be entering into a relationship with, a, with an NGO, especially one that's outspoke, outspoken like you guys are. So don't push us, right? And we respected that, and it made good strategic sense. So I think one of the things that we've learned and we're learning about partnerships is that there's no need to make things process heavy, and that often the costs of transaction are very high in those kinds of partnerships, and that formalizing things can slow things down. And what you're really interested in is getting the thing done, right? We needed the data. KPMG was interested in doing it. We helped them with the methodology. We sat together for hours talking about it, and they were very happy for us to help to write the forward. So we put our names on the forward. That's all we needed, right? So it demonstrates there was a partnership. We're now in the second phase of the, the, the partnership with the private sector, um, and we've we've targeted. So we we typically work with Sonka Gender Justice typically works with men where they are, and that means we go to bars and taverns. It means we go to sports stadia, um, but increasingly we've realized we need to go into boardrooms. So the next phase, because we've got the hook of KPMG and this report on the cost to the economy. The next phase is talking to CEOs and getting them to add their voices during the 16 days campaign um, to talking about what the costs are to the, their own companies as well as to um, those of them that we know have daughters and children who are affected by GDB. So uh, um, since I'm in Ireland, let me quote the poet Dylan Thomas who said, I do not need any friends, I prefer enemies. They are better company and their feelings towards you are always genuine. So, in talking about partnerships, why do I talk about enemies? 
Because I think the reality is, um, you know, that not everyone is your friend and not everyone is um, capable of entering into a partnership with you. And too often I think we run towards partnerships as though they are the be all and end all of our strategy. And our strategy needs, as ad activists and advocates, our strategy needs to be very much about mapping and figuring out where are the allies and where are the enemies. And are there times when you can enter into strategic partnerships with enemies and be very well aware of what you're doing? And where are the times that you don't need partnerships with your allies because you're on the same page don't bother, right? Move forward. Um, and I think at other times, what one of the things that we've learned as an organization that works, that started our work primarily with men and boys, is that the turf wars within civil society are often significant. And so once again, those who are, um, and so one of the things we've learned is that sometimes it's important to just keep moving. And that partnerships form while you're on the run. Right? right? That you don't, you don't always have to be standing still and waiting for partners to come to you. That sometimes it's important to move, and who moves with you, those are your friends. And who doesn't, right? They don't. Yeah. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about um, this whole area of, at the global level, of civil society and the funding story, because I know it's very much on people's um, minds. Um, the, the AIDS, uh, we've just done a report with the AIDS Alliance, and Asia Russell, um, a longtime activist, has made some really, really interesting points. Um, and she talks about the fact that um, civil society organizations kind of lost, uh, lost the plot a little bit at global level when it came to the global financial crisis. And this is unusual, right? So often we hear the story about how donors don't have any money anymore for civil society organizations because um, the global financial crisis came and wiped away all of their resources. And one of the things that Asia says uh, in this report, and I would really urge you um, to, to, to read it, is that essentially civil society has always fought for the things that it won. So the huge scientific victories that we now see emerging are because civil society organizations and people affected by AIDS said, we will not stop pushing until you do the research until you ask the questions, et cetera, et cetera. So medical advancements are not independent of activism. And similarly, the, the large resources that we saw being put into HIV and AIDS were very much a product of civil society activism. And they reached the point um, when the global financial crisis happened that many people, uh, many people in civil society began to um, put, take their pedal, the foot off the pedal and weren't as vociferous. And so in many ways, donors thought that they could get away with reducing the money. And we see this in the new allocations that we're beginning to see with the crisis of Ebola, right? So it's not a competition between diseases, and we never want to do that. But there is an indication that there's money that can be found, large amounts of money that can be found when new crises emerge, climate change, new crises are emerging, new things are sexy. And donors are able to find the resources for that. And that's partly because civil society activism hasn't been strong enough to keep the momentum going. And it's exhausting work, we know that. But it's really, really crucial. I'm running out of time. So let me make my last uh, point. My last point is about uh, the whole idea of solidarity. So I think the, the Ebola uh, example is a classic example of how far we still have to go in moving away from this idea of Africa as a continent of death, disease, and hopelessness, right? So Ebola has set us back very, very far. And one of the reasons it set us back is because as a sector, I think we don't engage with the media except when we need it. And then we get surprised when the media is putting forward images that we left long ago, long, long time ago, we stopped looking at Africa as a continent that's needy, that's a bet that hands up the begging bowl, right? And what do we get with Ebola? We get once again the shift absolutely to those standard stereotypical images and stories about what's happening that Africa just needs, needs, needs. And I think there's lots of fingers to, to point you know, the blame at in this. I think our own governments haven't been the greatest. Uh, we haven't done enough to sell, I'm glad the Nigerian ambassador is here, we haven't done enough to sell the story of how quickly Nigeria was able to just put the lid on that thing and deal with it itself without waiting for people to come from other places to help it, right? So, 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 so there's a story there, and the story is our partnerships with the media are instrumental. We send a press release to the media when we need them, but we don't invest 
in making sure that journalists understand the continent, the issues that we want, and the image as Africans of ourselves that we want the world to understand, let alone of global development uh, and, and global health. Um, so I'll end by saying three, three key points. One is that partnerships have to be smart and strategic. The second is that partnerships are sometimes important for their own sake, because when you enter into the partnership, you don't know where the journey is gonna take you, and so that's fine. But increasingly, I think partnerships work best when they're based on solidarity, when they're based on respect, um, and when they're based on a solid foundation of trust. I'll stop there. Okay, we started a little bit uh, late, but we think it would be really important just to give people an opportunity to ask uh, Suzonki uh, a few questions after that uh, really stimulating discussion. So thank you very much. Five minutes for, for questions. Um, please raise your hand if you... Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, my name is Kate and I'm a global health student here. Um, I just wanted to know, as, as a, well, I suppose as a person, but also as an activist, do you find it very difficult that you now have to, um, I understand that you also have to come up with new ideas to get people's attention, but do you find it very difficult that you now have to focus on the economics instead of that all of these women are dying, that we know, because I know it's also something that they do with refugees as well and asylum seekers, is they're starting to focus more on cost, uh, cost to the state, cost to the economy. And um, it certainly is a very important part, but it's quite far down the list in terms of, it's also a person. <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to take questions one by one? Um, well, if we have say three questions, Thank you. I'm Henry Tumawazi, former student at the Center for Global uh, from Uganda. I'm impressed by your million dollar campaign to eradicate that problem. Uh, my question or interest is what priority activities were you, are you going to put that money so that maybe you can learn something for Uganda because we also have such huge cases of gender based violence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, wonderful, wonderful talk. talk. And I particularly like your uh, take on money. You know, what's real big money, what isn't, and, and how we handle the press. I'm a malariologist, and I think as a community, we're a group that have hopelessly failed to engage, you know, I think in our positive stories. Um, I think globally, we could give everybody the basics that they need for about five, six billion dollars a year. And we failed to get that far. Do you have any insights to take us forward? Yeah. Okay. So, first question. You know, I I um, I become the older I get, much more mercenary about issues. So, when it comes to advocacy, you use what you need to use. It's, if it's truth, if it's if it's true, um, and it's going to get heard. Then, then, then we have to use it. So the reality is, the first port of call for me is always human rights, it's women's rights to live free from male violence. That's the bottom line. If that's not getting heard by our esteemed parliamentarians uh, in the South African parliament, then we've got to figure out other ways um, for them to hear it. I also think it's important to recognize that at a certain point, it's not about the arguments anymore. It's about the cost of not doing anything for them. So a huge part of our campaign is to mobilize women on the streets. Um, so the reason why um, the AIDS argument was heard in South Africa wasn't because we made all the fantastic te technical arguments that we made. It's because when the Minister of Health walked on the street, um, there was a group of treatment action campaign activists who, who did a citizen's arrest. Okay? <laughs> and went to the police station and charged her with genocide or whatever, right? So, so it was because there were you know, thousands and thousands of chapters of people 
who knew about truth and literacy, who made, who, when people arrived, you know, embarrassed the country, right? I mean, developing countries, uh, even though ours is middle income, but we're very much developing, are, you know, very, very conscious of their public image. And politicians anywhere in the world are very, very aware of where power really lies. So for us, it's really about mobilizing women's power the power of um, lesbian and gay activists who are also fed up of the, of the harass, the street harassment of being killed, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's it. So the arguments are one thing, and you need to, and so we have a two track, a, a technical approach and a street approach, and we, we need to do both, yeah? Um, in terms of where we're gonna put the money, so we have a great model already in South Africa, which is the South African um, National AIDS Council. Um, so the, the, the AIDS activists, um, you know, this is a sort of second generation now of fighting. So some of us are like tired <laughs> of fighting, but the reality is we fought and we got SANIC and there's a great model. So SANIC is set up as an independent trust. It receives an allocation from the Department of Health every year and money is put into, the, into SANIC. That also allows SANIC to receive money from the Global Fund, from you know, private philanthropists, from any number of organizations. And so that's what creates the, the budget for. So it allows it to move quicker than a government department would. If we just had the Department of Health responding to AIDS, it would be much more slow. Um, so that independent trust model is where we are um, pushing the government to put the, 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 the allocation of resources. And it gives us more people to, be, uh, to hold accountable. If we're only holding the state accountable, then it lets the private sector off the hook. In South Africa, corporate social responsibility giving is a significant amount of giving because of the kind of society we are. So big companies give a lot of money. They give that money almost predominantly to basic education because it's the easiest, most least controversial thing you could possibly do. And part of our campaign is to say, you need to do better than that and you need to look at the more complicated questions that are troubling our society. Um, and then the third question, malaria and how you make an ask for a whole bunch of money for something that no one um, cares about. You know, I think the issue with malaria is that um, we're so accustomed to poor people dying. Um, we're so accustomed to, um, to poor people dying and to, we can't make the same hooks around sexuality and an appeal to shame people about the mores that we did on, on HIV. And so that's uh, a, big, a big sort of hurdle that um, malaria has to, has to fight. One of the things that um, AIDS activists did um, is to make people very, very literate on the issue, but also to not allow it to be the headlines. And I know that's hard, but part of that is about, um, so I'm doing a fellowship at the moment with the Aspen Institute, and, the, uh, and it's funded by the Gates Foundation. And the idea behind it is that often we speak in jargon because we're used to speaking to a very small group of people, and that you have to open out your language. And so they provide developing, they say that developing country experts are the people who know the most about development and they're the people with the least access to global um, spaces, right? So how often do you see a developing country expert published in the New York Times? And how often do you see Jeffrey Sachs published in the New York Times? So the solution is not, and I, well, Jeffrey Sachs is a perfectly fine human being, but the solution is not to, um, to lobby Jeffrey Sachs to talk about malaria. The solution is to lobby me and, you know, the crew of thousands of very smart, very capable, very eloquent Africans to take this issue up and to have access to those platforms and to demand it. So it's not an easy answer and unfortunately the answer is a long, slow process, but it has to be one that is consistently fighting to get malaria into the headlines and to make it understandable to people that the cost of inaction at the ballot box, um, the cost of inaction in communities will be that you will be embarrassed. Um, and that means coming up with sort of um, sneaky ways about talking about budgets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm very happy for us to talk about it a little bit more afterwards, if you'd like. Okay, um, I think we will uh, stop there. Before Suzanki uh, goes, before her turban turns green, I'm forgetting she's about to leave, uh, please try and, and grab her uh, at uh, uh, tea, coffee. Um, we're running a few moments late, but for the moment, uh, thank you very much indeed for a you know, terrific talk. Thank you.